Pinterest feels really outdated and everyone makes the assumption that Pinterest is only exclusively for women who are trying to plan weddings or redo their house. And that's definitely not the case. There's three walkaways that I wanted everyone to take away with. There's one that Pinterest has the opportunity to bring you an avalanche of traffic and that there's a low amount of effort where there's still a high opportunity of long lasting impact for awareness to your brand. And that specifically with the proven formula that we've been crafting for like six years now, you'll have predictable success, not just on Pinterest, but with your subscriber and customer acquisition from Pinterest as a referral source. Hello and welcome to the Perpetual Traffic Podcast. This is the show where we share cutting edge strategies on acquiring leads and sales for your business through paid traffic. Nobody saw that coming. <laughs> I am joined by uh, the illustrious, brilliant, talented, and uh, delusional Lauren Petrullo. Lauren, thanks for being here. I think you meant significantly funnier instead of this Delulu nonsense, but mm, hello. You and I said the same thing in different ways. Um, we just got back from, Ve- well, I just got back from Vegas. How long have you been home? Saturday. Okay. I'm beat. Are you dying? Um, I have sounded better. Yeah, I agree. It was. I slept eighteen hours. I like. I. Hi. I just got that. What a delay. Um, I slept eighteen hours. Like I landed. I slept ten to five. I was awake for an hour and a half, and then I didn't wake up until like mid Sunday morning. Those events will take it out of you. If you're listening to this and you haven't been to one of the larger marketing conferences, they're worth going to. But you got to pack a Red Bull and some vitamin C or some, I don't know, uppers because. Man, they are just like, uh, what? Why are they so draining? Is it just all the people? Um, may, I, I think it's just overstimulation. You have so many different networking events happening. You have a lot of people. It's like a reunion almost for yeah. a lot of marketers um, who have been working together. You see clients. You see potential clients. If you're bringing team members, you're like uh, pulled in ten thousand different directions, practicing yoga. Mental yoga, emotional yoga. And then also the food is Vegas Horrible. food. So Yeah. Vegas is a death trap. Um, well, we had a blast. If you did not go to the Traffic and Conversion Summit, you can always purchase the recordings, which I'm not an affiliate, by the way. I don't know why I pushed the recording so hard other than I want people to go see my talk. <laughs> there uh, are some I- really good talks. Like um, I thought we got the recordings included. Um, which we don't. So we are buying the recordings uh, because uh, I loved watching Christine's talk. You were on that one as well, but I missed uh, Liz Jermaine's YouTube one. And I had my two team members taking notes like feverishly. And uh, they asked specifically to rewatch that one. And tomorrow in our office during our like team meet fun half hour every week, they're doing a teach out. So they built a presentation of everything that they learned from the event to teach others because they thought it was so good. Oh, I love that. The teach out. Um, I should steal that from you. I think everybody, you know, if you, if you, especially if you have multiple people going to an event, divide and conquer is the way to do it. Hmm. There's two people sitting in the same session. You know, even if you ta- have different takeaways, it's just the redundancy when there's so much good content up there. Um, I loved your talk. It was great. We're going to talk about that today. Uh, Christine Marie's, if you buy the recording, that would be one of the first I'd watch. Ralph did a great job. Ralph was the, that was the most packed talk of all TNC for the, no the breakout space. rooms. Yeah, yeah. Standing room only. He really, he really killed it. And he maintained it. Like there were some where like people had like conflicting meetings and stuff. So there was, there was in and outs, but I didn't see anyone leave. I just saw more and more and more and more trickle in. But he was definitely the math master. Yeah. Of that he was. And you know, when people leave my talk, I call them out from stage. <sighs> I like oh, you did. That. Someone yeah. had a phone ring and you're like, you can answer that. Yeah. I was like, go ahead. We'll wait. We're going to dive into one of the best talks at Traffic and Conversion, which happened to be Lauren Petrullo's talk, which you started the talk in an interesting way. You basically told people that, and I'm going to paraphrase, but you're like, I, I'm going to bore you or no, I'm going to make the most boring topic interesting. And I dare you to challenge me on this or choose otherwise how did i do there what would how would you how would you tee it up for anybody who's listening what is it we have, we get to expect um i specifically said it's the shittiest talk you're gonna listen to because it's playing right. off of the gif movement but also that i think i might have said something along the lines of um i get it pinterest is so 2015 and you're probably questioning why you're in this room 
If I didn't say that specifically, I meant to. Yeah, which is funny because, you know, if I, I'm i actually even interested in how we drive people to this podcast because if we put Pinterest in the title, nobody's going to listen to it, which is a <sighs> catastrophic error because as you explained, Pinterest <clears throat> might be one of the, you know, undiscovered pools of high quality traffic. Uh, for me, I mean, I'm biased, obviously, because we have done so much within the Pinterest sphere. It's just that it's a desperate blue ocean seeking out content in a way that, you know, when you have three times more active users than LinkedIn um, and you have, I mean, LinkedIn, like, don't get me wrong, they have a very different market and the average user on LinkedIn probably has a higher income than most other uh, social media platforms at large, but still Pinterest, it's like half of their audience has over a hundred thousand dollars a year of annual income. And it's like 90% or 85% of people that use Pinterest to research a project or a solution, purchase or start that project. So their, their initiative is really high. And Which it's makes not sense because it's like a digital whiteboard, right? If somebody's on the whiteboard, they're, they're effectively already middle of the funnel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's cut to a break. Ralph's got a pay for what, Lauren? What is it? We're, we're running an ad so Ralph can make money so he can pay for his... Uh, quesadilla slicer. He needs a special <laughs> knife just to cut up quesadillas. Just for... But he's from Boston, so I'm pretty sure they pronounce them quesadillas. Quesadillas? Oh, goodness. Yeah. That's the Bostonian pronunciation of <laughs> quesadillas, quesadillas. So we're going to cut to a quick break so Ralph can, Ralph can pay for his quesadilla slicer. And when we come back, Lauren Petrullo is going to tell you why Pinterest is the best traffic channel you've never used. And we're back with Lauren Petrullo of Mongoose Media, who also incidentally owns three e-commerce brands. She's quite the prolific entrepreneur. And uh, today she's going to talk to us about what was the title of your talk at TNC, Lauren? Uh, how to tap into the 450 million prospects that your competition is ignoring. Ooh. All right. We're all ears. Are you going to go visual with this or is this just you talking? Uh, I would... Ooh. I would say just talking. Okay. We're going to talk through it. You can still watch us. Lauren is wearing a fuzzy, bright isotope green. What is that color? Neon highlighter. Neon. Hi it's yeah. very comfy. If you, if you were to like touch me, that sounds weird. I wouldn't. But it's, it's very soft and, and fuzzy. Like yeah. I'm a nice huggable person right now. You're me tooing me right now. Those <sighs> two verbal assaults that were levied at me and everybody heard. So I'd ask you to keep yourself to yourself. Deals. Okay, all the way from Orlando to Arizona. Yes, please keep your hands to yourself. That's right. But this is, it's a fun, like, I feel like a teddy bear. Like, yeah, I get that. Yeah. All it's right. a poor decision for a Floridian because that's like a humidity magnet, isn't it? And then also, you, don't you get like the electrical, whatever? Static, shocky kind of thing. Yeah. It's like cold in Florida right now. It's like 70, 65, 70 degrees. I am, I'm chilly at this like 18 degrees Celsius. If that's the right conversion. So I am bundled up. No, I went to public school. We don't do Celsius. Let's do Pinterest. The floor is yours. Um, shitty talk. Let's see if you can hold our attention. We're excited and the bar is low. Um, okay. So just as Cosm said, I introed and said, like, we'll be super honest that Pinterest feels really outdated and everyone makes the assumption that Pinterest is and only exclusively for women who are trying to plan weddings or redo their house. Um, and that's definitely not the case. And I'll explain more specifically in a bit. Uh, but in the presentation, um, you know, there's three walkaways that I wanted everyone to take away with. There's one that Pinterest has the opportunity to bring you an avalanche of traffic. An avalanche, um, you said. And absolutely. It's cold. It's winter. Avalanche of traffic. And that there's a low amount of effort where there's still a high opportunity of uh, long lasting impact for awareness to your brand services and solutions, as well as um, returning visibility, traffic, and then ultimately subscribers and, and customers and all that jazz, because 
like if we talk about the real life understanding of uh, lifetime decay for social medias, Pinterest stuff will last six to 12 months. Whereas like your tweet lasts 18 minutes, then your Facebook post lasts four hours and your Instagram post maybe lasts two days. So the longevity of Pinterest and uh, the amount of effort to obtain that longevity is minimal with maximum amount of return. And that specifically with the proven formula that we've been crafting at Mongoose Media for like six years now, you'll have predictable success, not just on Pinterest, uh, but with your subscriber and customer acquisition from Pinterest as a referral source. I'm interested. You've yeah. <laughs> so far haven't scared me off or put me to sleep. Ah, oh, boo. Quite wow. the surprise. Ah. Well, as I said in the thing, I was like, it was my hour, my rules. I like laid it down super clear. And I was like, you know, you're going to have three parts. It's like traffic acquisition, subscriber acquisition, then of course, customer acquisition. And then so much of it was front loaded with the traffic acquisition because it's a traffic and conversions conference and you're supposed to bucket sure. your conversation to one. But I thought I would be remiss not to talk about how you monetize all that traffic. Um, but in terms of like my hour, my rules, like I had a giveaway um, and the team chose someone who was an enthusiastic participant. So I didn't call people out if they walked out, but they would have been like removed from participating in this giveaway. They would have been DQ'd. <clears throat> DQ'd, yes. Yes. Uh, which means disqualified for all that, those. For all the non-athletes. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, I was like, yeah, can I just challenge real quick, not challenge, but just ask, because you said everybody thinks Pinterest is just for people that are remodeling their houses. And that's, that's actually kind of what I think. And so help me understand the broader use cases. If you were to break it down categorically, is there data on this as to who's using print Pinterest for what purpose, how it might be applicable? Like help me understand the broader demographic available to me if I wanted to advertise on Pinterest and, and, and how I can see that. Sure. The out the gate, it's only 60% identify as women that use Pinterest. So there's 40% that are not female. That's mostly men that are using Pinterest and they're still planning just as much. We break. So that's like statistics that come from Pinterest. And then you look at the U S environment is like 60 or 75%. I can pull the stats later from Pinterest specifically because it is a global platform and India and Russia are interesting. The two largest emerging um, audiences. India is a new market to Pinterest. And like, that's something if anyone is looking at expanding and going into the Indian market, like when I worked at Disney, the Walt Disney company, this was a huge subject because India has a billion people and the closest Disney park was too far for them to get to. But the India piece is something that like I secretly am geeking out on, but, uh, 60% are women. So 40% are not. And then you have, um, city audience breakups as well. So, I mean, we manage dozens and dozens of Pinterest accounts, so you can see how that breakdown varies. Uh, but of course you have like larger populations typically in like Los Angeles and New York, but the 85% of people that start a project or seek a solution are buying. And the best part is like they're six to nine weeks ahead of where someone is in their decision cycle. So especially if you're an Amazon brand seller, you can get ahead of those white label folks who are selling the exact same product. Um, it's a chance to become one of the only considerations for a solution. I would do a lot of advertising for major universities. Those are high ticket solutions for continued education or higher education. And we knew that if you were not in their five, <clears throat> if you weren't in the five considered by age 18, like when they turn 18, you weren't really considered. You'd have to be a Hail Mary random like, Maybe your significant other, like your boyfriend or girlfriend, is going to that university. Therefore, you've changed your mind. But it had to be top five before they were 18 or you weren't even considered. And this pinch, I mean, as far as use case, is this all uh, B2C, e-com, consumables? Is there, any, is there a space for B2B or lead gen or high ticket? Oh, 100%. So we break all clients on or accounts on Pinterest into two categories, the obvious and the non-obvious. If you're in the obvious category, weddings, interior design, food, you not being on Pinterest is obviously a dumb decision. Sure. And I, is it safe to assume that most of those brands know that? Like, Yes. I, okay. Well, I would say it's safe to assume. And if you're listening and you didn't know that, well. Now you do. I do. No excuses. Yeah. 
But um, for the non-obvious one, it's actually even stronger. So if you're in the obvious place, you just have a, a shorter conversion cycle. But if you're in the non-obvious space, you have such a demand for what they're looking for that you're going to have greater success in comparison at most times. So we've we've seen success for folks that have been in like the water filtration space, in the mechanic space, in the B2B space, all these like non-obvious course creators, info products, um, podcasts, like not just the Perpetual Traffic Podcast, but there's other podcasts where it's just this content where Pinterest is a really good channel to add fuel to the fire and amplify your existing marketing efforts, but it's not the place I would start for sure. How does Pinterest cross pollinate with other channels? Have you noticed an amplification of Pinterest inside of like Meta or Google or vice versa? Have you noticed that Pinterest can nurture top of funnel and awareness building campaigns in other channels? Um, well, Pinterest is indexable. So your content gets ranked on Google. So that's like one of the biggest takeaways, I think, for a lot of folks in the audience, because there are also a bunch of SEO people in the audience that were like praising and clapping back for me and telling the people nearby how successful Pinterest has been for their website's organic traffic, for their website's domain authority, for ranking them and getting them to show up in organic searches, even off Pinterest. So that cross-pollination for organic, the, the pictures are indexed because it's the largest visual search engine in the United States. The content is indexed because Pinterest itself and Pinterest in all these different countries, like all those links are 90 plus domain authority links. And in my presentation, maybe I had like 81, 82 for like Pinterest.Japan, um, but they're curating people's pins to use as marketing for Pinterest and in their blogs and they're getting high traffic uh, visibility and the pins that they're curating the blogs, giving you that link juice. And it's just so prolific from an SEO standpoint. And then going back to that longevity of those pins, because Pinterest is the intersection of a search engine and social media, you have it's keyword based, it's keyword rich. So when someone is searching for that solution, that content, your pins will show up not in a chronological feed, not like based off of when it was published, but based off of the words that you're using. And where also are those keywords being searched, but in Google, in Bing, mm. and in all those other search engines. So that cross-pollination is huge. That that point you just made about it being uh, the, the intersection of a search engine and a social media app is interesting. And I'm trying to think of other applications that are like, and I've, I've, I keep hearing about TikTok becoming a search engine as much as it is a social feed. But even then, it's like, it's got to be 90-10, right? It's like 90% social 10% search 99 one. Yeah. Pinterest might be the only one I can think of that's, it feels equal parts because you can't engage with Pinterest without searching. It's not really, I mean, you can, but it's not, it's not meant for that. It's not browsing as much as it is intent based. Hmm. And the reason I'm making that point is because I feel like even though the traffic is smaller on Pinterest, intent based traffic is worth so much more than the time killers, like intent-based traffic, I'd take one intent-based impression for every hundred awareness impressions you can give me. You know, if somebody's on a mission to accomplish a goal and do something, even if the thing I'm selling isn't necessarily directly related to the goal they're trying to accomplish, they're in a frame of mind of taking action. So I think that's a really significant boon to Pinterest and something that we shouldn't ignore. To that, like taking action, it's also rewarding within the algorithm because it's your Pinterest provides greater visibility to your pins organically or paid when you're inspiring someone to take action. So it's not the like keep them on platform. Pinterest literally wants them to leave. So the more that they leave, the more your visibility stuff. It's not like, hey, continue, stay on this platform, subscribe for more, stay tuned for the next episode. None of that. It's like, get off, go start your project, go make your purchase. Um, and where I think that like social media piece really dappers off of Pinterest, where I really think the social media search engine hybrid matters more is it's the most unsocial social platform. You don't have to reply to comments. You don't have to manage any DMs. There's none of this community building that you need to do because they all are doing it themselves and they don't want you to participate in the conversation. That's really interesting. The problem that I see with Pinterest, well, I'm going to ask this question a different way. Are you advocating for organic or paid um, or both? Both. I mean, the organic, what we do in our formula, which I'll go further to make sure everyone like gets what, how we do it. Um, yeah. You can achieve 
the a level of organic visibility that you can only get with paid visibility or like incredibly viral one-offs on other socials. So what we're achieving organically is what you usually have to pay for. But when you layer in the paid side, then you just have this marketing efficiency because you're able to be more direct, more specific. And we can see like, you know, $7 a day campaigns, which I don't recommend anyone do. I always recommend if, when you start, like, you should start with $50 a day. But, you know, some people are like still skeptical because it's like women, weddings. I'm like, not true. Um, but you're, you're going to see cart orders and leads generated at prices that can, are unmatched on other social media platforms, unless you're spending like a grand or five grand or 10 grand a day. And Mm. the other component is like, it's just like going down to numbers. If you're starting at like how you're keeping scores CPM, it's like 69 cents to two bucks for a thousand impressions. And all of that is based on keywords, which goes back to your intent based. Yeah. Intent based traffic. So, and, but just to clarify, are you using Pinterest ads or are you using all or mostly organic? We are using both, but everything I presented was only on organic traffic. Okay. That's what I thought. I remember, you know, I sat through your presentation. It was great. I was, uh, I'm quite the Lauren Petrullo fan, as you know. I thought you did a phenomenal job. My skepticism with Pinterest paid stems from where it lands in the funnel. Sure. Top of funnel traffic is easy to pay for because you know you're doing awareness building and, and the need for attribution is effectively zero. Bottom of the funnel traffic is easy to pay for because the attribution opportunity is there. Even if you can't track the conversion, you can track the media efficiency ratio. It's cash in, cash out. Middle of the funnel traffic is hard to pay for Mm. because you don't – I don't know what KPI I'm trying to look at to to see the predictive indication of intent. Obviously, at the end of the day, I want lift in conversion, right? It's conversion lift, the halo effect, et cetera, et cetera. But you, you have to have some predictive indications because otherwise you just have to run for months and months. So what, where in the funnel and what KPIs are we looking at when running paid inside of Pinterest? So paid for middle of the funnel, I would just straight up go for add to cart. How many have indicated, okay. specifically for e-commerce, <clears throat> yeah. how many have indicated interest in what you're selling? And then if you're starting off with paid ads and you want to see like, Hey, is Pinterest a viable solution for that middle of funnel? Look at that cart. You can see how much revenue they're adding to the cart. You can see what your cost per ad to cart is. And we don't have a client that has cheaper costs on other platforms like Facebook or Google. Sorry, I keep coughing. Like it's this like Vegas aftermath of everyone sounds like Phoebe from Friends singing Smelly Cat, in my opinion. But if you don't know that reference, oh, I feel old. But um, don't laugh at this. Okay? I love that this tangent keeps getting worse. Like there's no <laughs> there's no saving it. We're just going to steep in, in the um, shame of having ruined my podcast here, Lord. Ah, oh, Ralph, where are you? But um, Can I just pause for a moment and say that, that Lauren and I have a very healthy – uh, I would call very healthy uh, uh, rivalry. And so if anybody thinks I'm being too mean to her, you need to go back and listen to previous episodes. Where she, where she started it, first of all. And second of all, she's been far meaner to me in, in other areas. So please. I'm Possum's favorite, favorite friend. I'm not going to let him debate that to anyone else. And it's like, we're siblings. And so Ralph is our, our father and he's not here to mitigate this stuff and you're just being nicer than usual. But Yeah, I'm the smart overachieving child and you're the one that we keep having a bail out of prison who wears fuzzy <laughs> green sweaters. Okay, well, I think there's a better way to describe how I am as the child, but none of that is coming to mind at the moment. So I, I concede this one time. We have to get back to value, Lauren. People are listening. They're tuning out. They're looking. They're searching right now for Neil Patel's podcast. Hey, look, Eric Sue is on Neil's Patel's podcast. Okay, no, we're going to be on their podcast soon. We're we're talking about a podcast swap. So I like oh. both those guys, but I don't want to lose listeners. <laughs> Okay, okay. Middle of funnel people, if you're looking yeah. for it, I'm just telling you, unless you have an account, like I love Facebook ads. That's my favorite. I know you're the Google ads, like whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, but um, when you look at side by side, same campaigns, same product groups, same everything, especially for e-commerce right now, um, your ad to cart costs, your revenue 
in your cart, all of those things side by side, Pinterest is winning. Lower cost, higher carts. So then it's not a middle of the funnel traffic strategy. Is my, I mean, it, it really can impact just straight up. I'm going to use words I hate, but it can impact ROAS, uh, improve ROI, improve conversions. Caveat, because okay. I'm going to be super transparent. Where um, Pinterest is a really good tool if you want to test and see how well you can do, because people will tap out, right? There's only so much search market impression share if you're doing like standard shopping campaigns on Google. Um, People can't scale beyond certain ad spends sometimes within the Facebook ecosystem. If you're looking at expanding outside or even testing a new environment, um, we don't see the same CPAs, so customer acquisitions, for e-commerce same to same. Higher CPA costs on Pinterest, but everything else for that middle of the funnel, Pinterest is winning almost all of the time. The biggest exception being when your budget, your marketing spend is imbalanced. Your The amount of money you're spending in an ad platform gives way to competitive advantage in the auction. Yeah. Well, and that actually, that cuts both ways. I call it self-imposed inflation. You can actually spend so much in an ad platform that you increase the value of the inventory you're bidding on. Mm, fair. I've seen a lot of, I see, uh, well, maybe I won't use his name, but I have a friend who's in the challenge space. Mm-hmm. And if he goes after too small a niche, because he's so used to spending millions marketing a single challenge, he learned the hard way that he can actually increase the value of that inventory because it's an auction. Yep. And so he bids against himself effectively is how that ends up working. And so I can see how that, you know, with a smaller ecosystem like Pinterest, I could see how that could kind of work on a larger scale. Okay, so you have a how, what is it, your three steps, how to? Uh, like in our, oh, well, the three takeaways, or you mean like what the formula was? And- you mentioned a, there's a formula for how to use Pinterest. Yeah, so uh, being a visual search engine specifically, um, if you want to be lazy, you can find success on Pinterest by just categor- categorizing. God, I hate nope. that word. Mm-hmm. Nope. Mm-mm. Taking inventory of all of the past posts you've ever done on Facebook or in Instagram and then porting them over into Pinterest. Just copy paste. Doesn't have to be the right size of a one by three, or sorry, yeah, 1,000 by 1,500. So two by three, not one by three, two by three format. It doesn't have to have keywords rich in the title and rich in the description. You can just take all of the previous posts you or a VA created and upload them into Pinterest, organize them into boards, which are like playlists and let them be. We have accounts that we see and I showed in the presentation that haven't been touched in five plus years, still generating hundreds of thousands of views on repeat. I have an idea. So at the Driven Mastermind, <laughs> uh, Rachel Miller won Wicked Smat, oh. and uh, she had one of the best presentations I've ever seen. She takes Facebook group posts, and Facebook allows you to export your posts. There's a little export all posts button in Facebook Manager. Mm. I didn't know this. And you export all your posts, and then you can organize your posts. You can sort them descending according to engagement. And so you can take your highest engaged post. And so if you have 2,000 posts, that's probably too much to bring over to Instagram. And even if it's not, Let's say that you want to do slight modifications or you want to bring over your best content or whatever. So you sort by engagement um, and it's this is now a CSV file. Uh, but these posts in Facebook are text-based, generally speaking. Mm-hmm. Um, but you could then bring those into chat. And this is not this is where I'm, I'm making a departure from <coughs> Rachel's Wicked Smart. You bring those into chat GPT and then you write a prompt and you get chat GPT to pimp each one of those out as a Dolly 4 image. And you could even write a Pinterest specific prompt because I'm sure there's certain types of imagery that perform better on Pinterest. And so you can take your highest performing Facebook posts and then with AI, turn those into Pinterest fodder in like 20 minutes. For sure. And well, this is unconfirmed, but sources are saying that Pinterest is even just layering in the AI piece to it. So I bet you wouldn't even have to do those pieces. You just can import the image and then they'll optimize the title and description based on that for you no so way. that it's coming from them with keywords. I mean, this is un- unconfirmed. Yeah. Um, but but why would you- that actually makes all the sense in the world? Unconfirmed, but also stupid if they don't do that, given that it's their, their application value is nullified if people don't properly tag their images. Sure. I mean, it okay. makes sense. 
It makes sense. Yeah. It's Don't like play the... coy with me, Laura. <laughs> But uh, to that effect, like, yeah, that if you can export that. And so she's saying that you can do it from a group. Uh, I would assume then the same is true from a, page too. from a page. I would assume yeah. the same mm-hmm. because all groups are recognized as a page. Then that would make me think if you're an admin, can you do that for another person's page? And then say you're like, hey. Oh, you're so smart. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to. I love I love this repurposing idea inside of Pinterest. By the way, if you don't know Rachel Miller, everybody should know she's one of the smartest marketers in the whole wide world. She also has her own um, AI tool that allows you to create digital products. Shout out to Rachel Miller and Busy.ai, B-I-Z-Z-Y.ai, which I'm just dropping because she's my friend and I love her. But also, I like I came into Rachel's world because she made these cards that were really cool. Where if you didn't know what to post on social media, she oh, literally made a knows. deck of cards front yeah. and back, and it was just prompt, prompt, prompt. So if you have those, boom, you now have like three hundred Pinterest pins. She's that you so don't smart. have to write. Uh, continue, please. Carry on with your instructions. Make us all Pinterest rich. Pinterest rich. Yeah. Um. So because like the lazy version, right? You just take existing purpose. But if right. it being a visual search engine, if you have quality images, you will by default perform better because you have such a supply and demand. So the stronger your visuals, the stronger the performance. And How do you think AI is going to imp- impact Pinterest then? Because I feel like AI is massively commoditizing the value of quality imagery. Well, I, I mean, I think it's going to be in this like uniqueness of it because you can leverage quality images. Like we we have clients that don't have any images and we just use the same stock photos available in Canva and Deposit Photos and all the other stock photo image libraries and reusing that same image. We have this assumption that Pinterest can read and recognize how many times the same image has been used over and over and over again across the millions of accounts. Uh, but I think by having AI, you have the ability to have high quality images with specificity that's relevant for what you want to have it say mm. without it being the same old, same old, same old brown haired, attractive marketing female. Dirty old female that, Caucasian brunette, attractive, smiling, making eye contact. That always performs the best always performs the best yeah but what's really cool about like with pinterest and stuff um you have such niche audiences like one thing i love about pinterest and i'll get back to the formula is that um a lot of the people that are on pinterest are not on other social channels because they feel afraid that the other channels are are tracking too much of their data oh so pinterest is like the libertarian social media platform yeah that's a i like it more now oh there you go because you're you're not engaging with the brands right? You're not being told to stay on the platform. You're connecting yeah. with other people specifically to figure out how to uh, finish a project, start a project, or find a solution. So people feel safer on Pinterest because it's not something they're doom scrolling. It's not something that they're consuming nonstop. Mm. It's a place where they're like whiteboarding and seeking out solutions and they're being inspired to take action and do something in the world. That's cool. So with that being said, like the stronger the visuals, the greater the performance. Um, keywords are the like quintessential element of success because that's where most people will find your content. There are other ways, of course, community groups and all that jazz, but most of the traffic is going to come from keywords. So leveraging keywords in all spaces possible, like the, the image, the title, and the description, and even in times using it on the boards that you're just you're claiming them as like you're organizing them. Think of it as like a playlist, right? You have your, your breakup playlist. You have your, your morning routine playlist. You have, I'm singing the shower playlist, all those different organizations of those pins go into a board. Leveraging Pinterest keywords is massive. And the way you can leverage those Pinterest keywords is not by paying 99 bucks plus a month for some keyword software, but by going into Pinterest itself and typing in, your main keyword that like if you're writing content about a podcast, if you're writing content about an iPhone, if you're writing content about a specific plant or you're writing content about a a program you're selling, typing in the basic keyword and seeing what predictive terms come up in their search bar. Mm. So laziness is spending less than 10 seconds typing in what you're trying to promote into the search bar and being told verbatim what you need to include in your title and your description. That's one of my favorite things to do in Google is to use Google predictive search to inform me as to what other people are searching. And it ends up being a grid because you type the, you know, like for instance, um, 
Google ad agency software will result in like 15 predictive results because it'll be software service or names and whatever. And then each of those 15, when you type those in, then they result in different results. So I imagine Pinterest is the same way where you could spend quite some time diving deeper into the rabbit hole as you get informed as to what some of the long tail searches are. You can, and you can even go further by just going straight to trends.pinterest.com and then finding the beginning of new rabbit holes because it's a free website and it allows you to figure out what is up and coming and what the demand is for. Like they're, they're laying it out on a silver platter and saying, hey, this has the greatest opportunity right now. If there's any way you can leverage this conversation, join in because we see such spikes in this. And they'll show you um, across regions. It'll show you the history of those specific search terms and a whole lot more. So like where I think Pinterest is a really good tool in your marketing wheelhouse is that when you get to the point of leveraging Pinterest and even just like lazily posting what you've done in the past, you can then use trends.pinterest to determine what to post next on the other social channels. Because as I said in the presentation, October is when Christmas is on fire for Pinterest. So if you're going to make all your Christmas content for your other social platforms, you'll be told verbatim what is trending now on Pinterest is predictively going to trend in the following weeks for Christmas. So I went to the trends.pinterest thing, which is pretty cool. And they have this uh, Pinterest predicts. Have you seen that? Mm Mm-hmm. So like the 2024 predictions as to all, and that's the thing is I say like as to, and then I look at everything that they have and it's, it's pretty robust and eclectic and broad. Some of the stuff that they're saying, um, there's a new home trend in town, meet Western goth, your soon to be decor obsession that'll mix vintage Americana chic with deep moody hues. You know what I really like about this is that if I were a, if I were a media buyer, especially any anybody in a, in a graphic medium just because this is the trend in home decor doesn't mean that we wouldn't want to carry this over because if there's a theme or a palette that's about to hit the you know hit the market mm. why wouldn't you incorporate that into your ads you know like you just make yourself resonate so much faster um this is pretty cool i like the trends piece it's also really good for product development if you're trying to figure out what new solutions to bring to market. So if you're looking at decor to sell, for example, on Amazon, you could start sourcing that type of content now because if it's predicting based on search volume, being in the top 15 social networks in the world within that top 15 list includes five messaging platforms like WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, Telegram, and more, you know that that trend isn't like myopic but an opportunity for you to capitalize on. I'm looking at the Pinterest e-com feeds too. These are amazing. I've never paid it. And can you buy directly from Pinterest? Is that oh. the CTP that I'm seeing? Okay. So uh, Pinterest in April last year made an agreement with Amazon. So they've been working and they've had this whole shuffle of new executives and like their chief revenue officer had like this whole like great mm-hmm. amount of contribution to like stuff at CES. Um with that relationship, my assumption is that you'll be able to buy with Prime directly. Oh, right now, wow. it's just all links, which is where it's so much value for your website's domain authority and all that SEO goodness. Because like I said, it was so great like seeing and hearing from all the SEO folks in the audience. They were like, yep, this has been one of our untapped secret tricks that no one talks about because they ignore Pinterest thinking that it's like archaic. I'm like, ha ha. This is really cool, Lauren Petrillo. I'm impressed with Pinterest. It's quite Pinterest. I'm actually impressed with the in-app experience. It's, you know, it's kind of fun and sticky and I've only clicked three times, but I'm already just down this insanely deep rabbit hole. And you're right. It's not doom scrolling. It's in, it's intent based. Like I can see how this would immediately result in a conversion. As a matter of fact, on my third click, I'm on a store. There you go. And I'm clicking to the store through the feed instead of staying inside of Pinterest. So anyway, if you're not playing with Pinterest or on Pinterest, especially if you're in the e-com space, I'd strongly recommend it for what Lauren's saying. Um, And then, you know, they're promoted apps. Oh, I've accidentally ended up on the lingerie section. (laughs) Their promoted ads really blend with their organic listings, which is an ad manager I love. I love when people can't tell the difference because I'm evil, Um, (laughs) but they've done a good job, but you know, they still call it out as promoted, but it doesn't break the continuity. 
There are some that, like, you'll see, the more you participate, the more you'll see, like, those just ads just don't perform well. Mm -hmm. But when you're using these optimized descriptions and, like, you have strategic pinning, that would just be, like, specifically on the organic side, you want to make sure you're consistent. Because if you just start and post 200 today and then do nothing for six weeks, you'll hurt yourself more than if you just post one a day for the next six weeks. So the consistency thing is like way, way more appealing. But um, for ad wise, specifically videos are just performing the best right now, like 100%. Um, and then things that are really cool are like rich pins, where Pinterest is like, we want to provide value, we want to provide content, it's a visual search engine. So whether you have an e commerce brand or a lead generation or service, if you have a blog, and you have the Chrome extension, you can right click on that image and Pinterest will make a pin for you. That's really cool. But that's Chrome only? Is it? Does it cross? Like what if you're using Safari? I don't use Safari, so I don't know. I am a Chrome loyalist. I don't use Safari either. I feel like a lot of people do. Maybe, is there a Safari extension? There must be. I'm sure. Yeah, I derailed you. What's left on the proven process? Proven process? Proven um, Pinterest process. Oh, direct linking is a huge thing. Um, when we audit Pinterest accounts, we find all the time people make these pins and then never did a direct link. And I'm like, what's the point? You want to inspire people to take action and then you just dead end them. There's no action to take. Um, so leveraging direct linking and then um, going back into Pinterest analytics specifically, because you can see the engagement on your pins, you can see the engagement on your account, you can see the demographics, you can see the audience analytics gives you so much insight that it allows you to make decisions on a host of data points that are way more relevant than other platforms that just overwhelm you with justification KPIs. Mm. Did you just make that term up, justification KPI? I did. That's brilliant. I'm going to steal that from you. Go for it. You heard That's it from me I, I came up with it. How about it? But yeah, I mean, it's just like, it's it's obnoxious when someone's saying like, look how well this did. Look how many video views. Like, I don't care about video views necessarily. Like, I want, how many people left Pinterest and went to my site? How many people had intended action of exploring further? Because it's the marketing side. Then when you get to your website, which is where I go to the Pinterest CPAs are higher and at large, but all of that other top of funnel, middle of funnel elements is so much stronger that you have to have a website that'll do the sales for you because Pinterest isn't like the sales channel. It's the marketing place. It's to bring an avalanche of traffic. And then if you're, you've got lead magnets, especially if you're in the service spaces, those perform so well organically and like do phenomenal as lead generation ads because you get to get ahead of people that are planning and most lead magnets that people make that aren't consumed are because people are planning. And then if they're looking at them on other platforms, they're like, oh, it was interruptive. Okay, cool. But Pinterest has the intention of starting projects and searching out solutions. So when you can put in a hidden form field and know what the referral source is, we have been measuring how much more content is consumed, specifically on the click-through rate on those emails because we make a slight switch in our onboarding series when the referral source is Pinterest because we assume that they're higher top of funnel and in a bigger planning stage than other uh, resources, like if they're coming from Google, coming from Facebook, all that jazz. So we have a slight tweak and we just have a higher click-through rate on that referral source for lead magnets than others. And we can only measure that when we're doing not just Pinterest, but their marketing automation. So that intersection of why you should have an agency. I'm not vouching for us necessarily, but for any agencies, um, when you have the intersection of those disciplines together, you have the email people and the Pinterest people talking, and then you're seeing the the effectiveness of one plus one equaling three. That's a really good point about the agency piece. And it's a post acquisition problem. It's not just about having your traffic agencies talk to each other. It's about having your traffic and then your post conversion agency, assuming you have one. Uh, because how your traffic is impacting things like lead generation. You know, I mean, I think everybody's trying to measure the conversion piece, like the cash tell TV. Mm -hmm. But what about just how our leads are coming in and the efficacy of those leads and the quality of those leads? 
And that's the sales to marketing discussion that we always need to help support. Yeah. The mark the sales to marketing handoff is fun, but it's a yeah. nightmare. Anyways. Lauren Petrullo, you're brilliant. This is brilliant. Am I cutting you off too early? Or is there more to say about Pinterest? Do we need a part two? No, no. I mean, it's it's just a really good resource. If you're not using it, you should. If you get the recordings, you can see a very shitty presentation with lots of fun gifts. Um, but too long, don't listen. Really, really good resource for traffic. And then there's some smart tips that I shared that we found success with for converting that traffic into customers and subscribers. And if somebody wanted to reach out to you and work with you directly, they'd go to mongoosemedia.us. Yeah. Or Lauren is funnier than Cosm.com. I actually think I did buy that URL. Did you really? I should check. And I should make it definitely point to a... Hold on. You're going to buy this before I do. If I'm I getting it now. No. I think I, I, I think I did buy it. Buy it. Uh, where can people find you, Lauren Petrullo, if they want to follow you? Uh, Lauren E. Petrullo on all the socials. Because Lauren E. Petrullo. The E stands for Edwin? Absolutely. Obviously. What does it really stand for? Elizabeth. Elizabeth. The same name uh, as like six generations. Lauren E. Petrullo, all socials. If you're listening to this, thank you so much. We appreciate your time and attention as always. Uh, we want to be the best podcast on the planet. So if there's anything that we can do better, please go to perpetualtraffic.com forward slash better. You can tell us what we do right. You can tell us what we do wrong. You can also tell us other topics you'd like to hear about or other speakers you'd like to hear from. Uh, subscribe and leave a rating wherever you're listening. Those ratings are huge. They're so big and important because they help juicy algorithm and tell them that we know what we're talking about and people want to hear from us. Follow uh, Lauren at Lauren P e. Petrullo on all socials. Follow me at Kasim Aslam on all socials. And follow Ralph Burns at Ralph HB. You can also follow Ralph Burns over on LinkedIn where I know he posts a lot. Go back and listen to previous episodes. All resources and show notes are at perpetualtraffic.com. On behalf of my awesome co-host, Lauren Petrullo. Ciao. No. Is that, no. Is that really what you want to go with? What do you want me to say? Ha, 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 I don't know. Ha. You need a better call, like a better sign off. If you're better gonna be on perpetual off. traffic on a recurring basis, yeah, like Ralph, see ya. That's that's iconic. See ya. My, yeah, but you can't. Peace. Have it. No, that's mine too. What I are you know. doing? I, no, I should just do yours and steal it. All right. Uh, and for me, peace. <laughs>